Well, today we are kicking off a brand new series. We've been through the book of Daniel, and now we are going to roll through the book of Ruth. And so if you got your Bibles, you can turn with me to Ruth chapter one. Ruth chapter one, something maybe to write down a few notes with in case you're into that thing. Ruth chapter one is where we are going to be hanging. But like we like to do every time we kick off a new series, let me just give some background information on the book of Ruth as we launch into this new series. Number one, uh, Ruth is one of the two books of the Bible that are named after a woman. Esther is the other one. And uh, we really don't know who the author of Ruth is. Some believe it was Samuel, but the author is really not identified. So uh, we really don't 100% know who the author is, who was under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Secondly is Ruth happened during the time of the judges. If you got your Bibles and you're with me in Ruth, do do me a favor, just flip one page earlier to the end of Judges, Judges chapter 21, verse 25. So just literally one page earlier where it says this, it says, in those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit. In those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit. And so there was this period of about three or 400 years when that was the case. And it was really a time of just spiritual and moral uh, degradation for the nation of Israel. Foreign oppression uh, was going on. And we don't know when during those three or 400 years Ruth took place. We do know that it was during a time when there was a famine. And we do know that it was during a time Uh, when there was relative peace between Israel and Moab. And and so Ruth is primarily going to take place in the city of Bethlehem. But like we'll see today, there's going to be a family that is going to take a bit of a detour to Moab. And so let let me show you a map in case you want to know, have in your mind where that is. And so there's Bethlehem. And they're going to roll to the other side of the Dead Sea for a number of years and be in Moab before they return. And so it's a pretty intense how, how really Moab came to be and the father of the Moabites. In, in Genesis, you have Abraham, you have his nephew Lot, and Lot was spared from Sodom and Gomorrah. And then after that, you really have this disgusting account of how his daughters wanted to carry on their family line. And so they got their dad drunk and then committed incest with him uh, to carry on their line. And his oldest daughter did that with Lot. And their son was named Moab, and he was the father of the Moabites. And then you have the younger daughter did that with Lot as well. And their son was named Ben-Ami, and he was the father of the Ammonites. And the Moabites, it was just a a horrific uh, religion. The false god of Chemosh, again, if you're taking notes, it's C-H-E-M-O-S-H. C-H-E-M-O-S-H was like their false god. And, And here's how bad it was. The worship of that God, that false God, involved child sacrifice. That's how horrific it was. In fact, it says in Deuteronomy that it, once a Moabite was identified, that family couldn't be in the temple for 10 generations. That, that, that's how significant and how bad it was. For the most part, we're going to read of Naomi, Ruth, and Boaz. Uh, Ruth was a Moabite. We'll see that today. And we're going to see how really Naomi goes from a place of pretty, pretty utter despair today. And we'll watch as God will redeem that story and uh, bring his, his purposes through it like only he can do. So Ruth chapter one is where we are. And let's read the first five verses. First says, in the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem And Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech, and his wife's name was Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilian. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem, Judah, and they went to Moab and lived there. Now, Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, 
and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women. You might want to underline that part in your Bible right there. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other Ruth. After they'd lived there about 10 years, both Malon and Kilian also died and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. Now, can, can we agree that what you name your kids is a pretty important job of a parent, right? How many by the raise of your hand would say, when you were naming your kids, you took that job pretty seriously, right? You, you put some thought to it, you research maybe, okay, what are we gonna name our kid? How many have this story where, where someone threw out a potential name for your child, but that name was someone you couldn't stand 15 years ago in junior high? And you're like, no, nope, not naming them that. Okay, I remember that kid in junior high. I do not want that name. You ever been there before? Yeah, you had that, right? But it's, it's pretty important what you name your kids. Some people are very gutsy and they wait until the baby is actually born in the delivery room to name the child. And I couldn't do that, man, because it is very important. Here's what we got to keep in mind. In biblical times, it was even more important than it is today. Because in biblical times, your name was a central part of your identity. Now, you know, here's the deal. I don't know that Elimelech and Naomi got that memo. Because their parents did awesome at their name. But I think Elimelech and Naomi, they, they kind of dropped the ball. Here's why. Here, here's what their names mean. Elimelech, his name means, my God is king. Right? That's solid, right? That's, that's good. Naomi's name in Hebrew means pleasant and delightful. Right? So shout out to their parents. Right? My God is king, pleasant and delightful. You pass the test. Elimelech and Naomi, they named their kids Malon and Killian. Malon's name means weak or sick. <laughs> Kilion means tired or dying. <laughs> so you got Elimelech, you got Naomi, and you got their sons weak and tired. <laughs> so they, they, they didn't get that memo. But there's this famine in the land, in Bethlehem, and so they begin to roll towards Moab. Now, why was there a famine in the land? Well, it could be that there was a meteorological reason. It could be simply that, that there was no rain in that area. And so there was a famine after a number of years. That's possible. I think it's probably more likely that there was a theological reason. God had promised, if you keep me first in your life, there will be blessings, I will bring the rain, and you will be blessed and, and, and bountiful. But if you don't keep me first in your life, if you worship foreign gods, then I will withhold the rain and there will be oppression. And so you have the Israelites really in this cycle of they'd return to God and then they would forsake the Lord and then nations would be, you know, rise up to put them in oppression. God would then bring a judge to, to deliver them. They'd be restored back to idolatry. And this cycle went around and around. And so it's very possible that this was a, a theological reason that they had really forsaken the Lord. And so they were experiencing a famine. And so what does Elimelech do with his family? He goes to Moab. Now, were there more families that went to Moab? We, we don't know. The, the vibe here is that maybe it was just Elimelech and his family. But the Israelites, they couldn't stand the Moabites for a few different reasons. Moab would not allow Israel to go through their territory when they were freed from Egypt. Also, uh, Moabite women had, had seduced Israelite men. And the, the, the king of Moab, Eglon, he really oppressed Israel and they also really couldn't get their head around the incestuous relationship between Lot and his daughters. And so they didn't like Moabites, but you've got Elimelech taking his family to Moab. And it's, I think, possible that this was Elimelech really taking matters into his own hands 
instead of humbling himself before God and trusting in God's perfect sovereign plan. And so they are there and they get there and what happens, Elimelech dies. And so now you've got Naomi and her sons and what does it say there in verse four? It says, they married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other Ruth. Now, if you study this text, There's gonna be opinions all over the map on this, research all over the map on this, but I will say that there are theologians who believe that by these sons marrying Moabite women, they were stepping out of the law. They were forsaking the Lord because Deuteronomy had said that you were not to marry, you know, from pagan nations. Moab wasn't specifically mentioned, but being that they worshiped this false god, Chemosh, you certainly could put them in in the heart of that. And so it's very possible that these guys stepped out of the covenant plan of God to marry these Moabite women. Could I speak for a moment to all those who are here who are in Jehi, high school, college, young adult, you're single. The Bible makes it abundantly clear that a Christian is to marry a Christian. The Bible makes it abundantly clear. The most important decision that you will ever make in your life is to worship Jesus. The second most decision you will ever make in your life is to marry someone who loves Jesus. There can be a lot of things on your list of here's what I'm hoping to have in a spouse, but at the top of the list, number one must be they are passionately in love with Jesus because th- this is really one of God's just ways he, he sanctify us, sanctifies us, his protection, his blessing. The Bible says that we are not to be unequally yoked. And so I, I, I will tell you just with hopefully a, just a pastoral love that, that it is not God's will that you marry a non-Christian, but that Christians are to marry Christians. And, and, and let me give you, I would encourage you to write these down, five questions. If someone goes down that road of like dating a non-Christian, which I would just beg you never to do, but, but here are some of the difficult questions you're going to have to navigate down the line. Number one is this, who will come first, Jesus or my spouse, and how will I explain that to them? Who will come first, Jesus or my spouse, and how will I explain that to them? Number two, how will my spouse's indifference to God affect my own spiritual growth? How will my spouse's indifference to God affect my own spiritual growth? Number three, how will God be at the center of my family if my spouse isn't a Christian? Number four, how will my spouse's unbelief affect the eternal destiny of my kids and grandkids? Would you agree that, that it's, it's kind of easy to make just decisions in the moment? without thinking about the long-term impact of them. And yet we absolutely have to be thinking about our our kids and grandkids and our spiritual legacy. So like our kids and grandkids, they are begging us, begging you to really marry a Christian so they can experience God's best in their life. Number five is, will I trust in God's wisdom over mine? Will I trust in God's wisdom and God's plan and God's sovereignty over mine? So the Bible makes this abundantly clear. And so again, I beg you, don't even enter into a relationship with someone who is not passionately in love with Jesus. And so, so they're there and they're in Moab for a number of years. And after like 10 years, now Naomi's sons also die. And this is very difficult for her, not only emotionally and the loss of family, but on a practical level as well. Because again, this is biblical, to, in biblical times, being a childless widow 
put you in a very disadvantaged class. You, you had no way of providing for yourself. No, you, you, you basically relied on the generosity of strangers. And so that is where she found herself. And we pick it up in verses 6 through 22. Let's just read the rest of this chapter. It says, when Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, she and her daughter-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness. You might underline that word in your Bible right there, kindness. As you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me, may the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them goodbye. They wept aloud and said to her, we will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I, am I gonna have any more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there were still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughter, it, daughters, it is more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has turned against me. At this, they wept aloud again. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her, what? Her gods. You might underline that part in your Bible as well. Go back with her. So Orpah's going back to her people and her gods. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. So the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. When they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women exclaimed, can this be Naomi? Don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Lord Almighty brought misfortune upon me. So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. Would you raise your hand if you are a fan of going on walks? You're a walker. You like a good walk with family, friends. You just love to go on walks. We like walks. Our family likes to go on walks. And Carrie took a class in college, and it was called Walking for Fitness. Now, Carrie is super smart. She's super diligent, focused, responsible. She was a valedictorian of her high school and all that. So she's, she's on it. But when it came to this walking for fitness class with her roommate, there was cert, a certain amount of miles that you had to walk every week or whatever. And you had to have a certain amount of miles walked by the end of the semester to get an A. And they didn't quite meet that quota throughout the semester. So it got to the last day of the semester and Carrie and her roommate had to walk 30 miles in one day. <laughs> so they left after, at two o'clock as soon as class was over and walked 30 miles till midnight. They got in just before a curfew to get an A. So you've got Naomi and you've got Ruth and you've got Orpa, and they're on like this journey from, from Moab back to Bethlehem because they heard that the famine is over and they're walking along and Naomi's got stuff going on in her mind. She begins to think about her, her, her daughters-in-law. And you do see really the, the care and the compassion and the love that she has for them. If you look there at verse eight, where it says, says, she says, go back to you to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. 
That in the Hebrew is hased, H-E-S-E-D. If you're taking notes, we'll talk quite a bit about it in this series. And that's that word kindness. And what it literally speaks of is really someone powerful showing mercy to someone less powerful. And so she's praying this, this blessing, this prayer of blessing over her, her daughter's in-law. And they're like, no, we're not going. We're going with you. And then Naomi goes into what would be really her longest speech of this entire book. And she says, I want you to do the math on this. She's like, listen, I, I, even if I had another husband, think about this. It's going to be years before I'm going to have a son that's old enough for you to marry. And so what, how, what happens with that? Well, you get two different responses. If you look, look right here. So Orpa, she goes and, and she encourages her to go back to your gods. And so Orpa kisses her and goes. But Ruth does what? Ruth clings to her. And so this is incredibly significant. You've got two gals, two daughters-in-law who respond very differently to this moment. And I think it is a reminder that the decisions and the choices that we make matter way more think than do than we think in the moment. Our choices carry an incredible impact on those that will follow us. Because you might think, well, this doesn't seem like that big of a deal. But here's what happened. Ruth, she says, your God will be my God. There are some who would believe that this was a salvation turning point for Ruth right here. When she says, your God will be my God. Your people, my people. No, I'm not going back to Moab, to that culture, to those false gods. Your God will be my God. Some believe this was a significant salvation turning point in Ruth's life. And what do we know of Ruth? Well, what we'll study in this series is that she would become the great grandma of David and the ancestor of Jesus. What happened to Orpah? Well, after this, she really disappears from the pages of Scripture. Jewish tradition says that she went back to Moab to those gods, married a Moabite, had four kids who were giants, and one of her, her descendants was Goliath. That's Jewish tradition, says that. And so it's a pretty stark example for us that we, will we stick with the Lord and make choices that allow God's blessing upon those that will follow us in our family? Or will our choices create giants that other people will have to battle down the line. Pretty, pretty incredible. And so they go back, they get to Bethlehem and, and you've got people saying, Naomi's back, Naomi's back. And what does she say? She says, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara because that means bitter, because I'm very bitter. You see there, I came back empty. Look with me at verse 13, <coughs> where it says, it is more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has turned against me. I, I do believe that we see right here in, in Naomi, this, this emotion, this loss of her husband and her sons, there, there is a rawness or an authenticity to her faith that we can probably identify with. When you think about it, it it's, it's pretty incredible. On, on one hand, in verse eight, she's praying a prayer of hesed or kindness over her daughters-in-law. May God grant you kindness and love and blessing. And then saying, the Lord's hand is against me. And so there's like an authenticity and a rawness to, to her faith as she is just navigating her faith journey that, again, we probably identify with. What's a few things that we could just maybe, maybe jot down 
that we see just in this narrative right here, number one is this, it is okay to not be okay. And I do find it intriguing that we've actually seen this the last couple of weeks. We studied Daniel, we just concluded our Daniel study. And if you remember a few weeks ago, Daniel, right? He, he is waited because of the Jewish exiles. He's waited because of the opposition they're facing with the temple. He's waited because of the, the end times tribulation prophecy that he received. And so he's wearing sackcloth and ashes. He's not hiding the fact that he's waited. And now here's, here's Naomi and you gotta give her credit, right? She wasn't hiding the fact that she was going through some things. She wasn't walking a lobby going, everything's perfect when it's not, right? She says, listen, call me bitter. How you doing, Naomi? I'm doing horrible. How's life? The Lord's hands against me, right? So she, she's just being real. Gallup did a poll a number of years ago that said, if you could sit down with God face to face, well, there's the one question you'd ask him. And the number one question was, what, why is there evil? Why is there hardship and suffering and difficulty and challenges if only bank robbers broke their arms or got cancer? We could probably understand that. But when good, godly people walk through suffering and challenges, harder to get your head around, right? We do know that God created a perfect world and a perfect creation. We do know that. Things were perfect. But then he didn't want us to be robots. He created humanity with free will, which gives us the chance to love or not love, do good or do evil, and so enter hardship and suffering and challenges. <clears throat> because of that, there will be difficulty this side of heaven. And there will be questions because we're not in heaven yet. One day we will be, but we're not there yet. And so really we got a couple of different options as we face suffering in our own life. Certainly like Naomi faced, we can torment ourselves with questions or we can trust that God is fundamentally good even when things don't fully make sense. There will be questions, but what's powerful is we do have a lot of answers as well. We do know from John that, that Jesus cares deeply about what we're walking through. We do know from the Bible that, that he is close to the brokenhearted. We do know that we can pour our hearts in the Bible says, and he is with us every step of the way. And so we, we know these things, but is anybody else here like me in that sometimes I need to be reminded of the things that I already know? Does that make sense? Like we, we, it, it's, it's one thing to like talk about these things, but I promise you when I'm walking through these things in my own life, I need Carrie and other people to remind me of these things. And that's one of the beauties of, of the body of Christ of being a church family is it is okay to not be okay. And then we, we hug one another and we pray for one another and we encourage one another as we just walk through the rawness and the authenticity and the challenges of just life and faith. Secondly, is, is this, when we can't understand what God is doing, trust Him anyway. Number three is don't allow hardship to blind you to God's blessings. I, I do think that as Naomi was navigating this, maybe like is easy for us all to do. She says, I left full, but I came back empty. But what we know is that's not fully true, right? Because there was quite possibly this significant moment in Ruth's life, a transformation for her, 
She came back with a daughter-in-law who just pledged to be with her and to support her and encourage her and help her. But in the midst of that hardship, she just kind of missed that. And I think that's possible that even in the midst of hardship to say, Lord, you help me to step back and just see your blessings and see your goodness even in the midst of these challenges that I'm walking through. And I think it's, it's key to say, God, I'm, I'm gonna trust you anyways. And, and we're gonna watch this journey of Naomi and Ruth and, and Boaz and redemption is a key thing for the book of Ruth. Again, if you're taking notes, you might wanna write that down. Redemption is really a key thing. That's used somewhere around 23 times in this, in this book. And we're gonna watch God redeem stories. God do sovereign works, God do miracles. And in the hills and the valleys, the ups and the downs, God is faithful, God is sovereign, God is working, God is doing miracles, even when we can't fully see it. But he's working behind the scenes.